so welcome, welcome to Introduction to Smart Pointers and Why. My name is Mike, I'll introduce myself in a moment. I'm just kind of looking around to see, does anybody have their core CPP shirts on? Let's see, yeah, people have them around. Um, I don't know if uh, you folks know this, but they must have made this for me here, because on the back, what it says here, Grandma, I don't use new and delete in my code anymore. And that's perfect for this talk. That's why we're here. <laughs> so you're in the right place. Uh, and thank you so much for Core CPP for hosting me here. Uh, it's truly been a, a pleasure, and I, I can't wait for the rest of the conference here. Um, but with that said, let's um, dive into here. So, you know, some emphasis on this being an introduction today is in the title to Smart Pointers. Uh, but I think the part that's interesting here is the sort of why. Um, and in a way, when I was writing this talk and as I was diving into it, it became almost a systems talk. I was trying to understand, you know, the why of the smart pointers. I think we know some of the issues, but I want to kind of dive into uh, memory, understanding some of these things, and then see how we derive sort of the smart pointer classes that we have in the STL. And I think there's some value in that to not just seeing what's in the STL, but maybe what you'll develop other types of smart pointers as well. So to try to think about some of these key uh, decisions that we have. Okay, uh, so you'll get slides. So again, our goal, you know, for students, C++ learners, um, anybody um, who just wants to dive or maybe even just see a different take on smart pointers, um, you know, hopefully we'll learn a little about memory here, learn about pointers, and then why they're necessary and some of their powers, and of course, some of the responsibilities we have as developers. And again, really from the <laughs> back of the t-shirt, we want to see how smart pointers improve on, well, just sort of raw plain pointers that you would have in you know, the C language. Okay, so this is in a way a back to basic style talk, but I think there'll be something for everybody here, hopefully. All right, so I'm your tour guide. Uh, I teach uh, at Northeastern University in Boston. Here's another picture that looks somewhat like me here. <laughs> and I do um, some consulting, um, mostly in computer graphics these days, um, but in C++. And um, you can check out my other biography and these types of things here. Uh, code for the talk is available. There's lots of small snippets. Um, so we'll be looking at some code, so feel free to play with those. And of course, the abstract that uh, led you here for this talk. So thank you for choosing me. Now, as I mentioned, there's a little bit of prerequisite knowledge for this uh, presentation, but uh, don't worry, I'm assuming most folks here have, you know, use C++ a little bit, uh, but this should look pretty familiar. Um, you know, just thinking about what is a pointer. Um, and I always like to visualize these things, right? On the left side, here's just a variable storing some value, and of course, this variable needs some address uh, to store something. And then a pointer on the right side here, at least fundamentally how we learn about these things, is that it, a pointer, so this thing here with the asterisks, whether you want to put it next to the type or next to the variable name, uh, fundamentally just stores an address of a type. So an integer a pointer or a pointer to an integer here. Okay, and it's storing the address of x. Okay, so if you're good to go with that, you can proceed. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, I know you all subscribe to the core CPP YouTube. <laughs> Here's a couple, uh, you know, refreshers here on pointers, some other uh, back to the basic style talks um, from some folks. All right, so with this, let's go ahead and just start with memory. Um, and again, there's many different types of memory, and since we're gonna be talking about pointers, which are involved with storing addresses, I think that's a good place to start uh, when we sort of think about this. Um, and I mean, this is talking about the actual physical memory in our machines, which is important to understand. Uh, you know, the, the purpose of it is to store data. And of course, there's many different attributes of our memory, maybe how long do we wanna store that information? So volatile, non-volatile, these types of things. Uh, and then where that actual storage is. So, uh, you know, usually if you talk to somebody just starting computer science, they're thinking about their hard drive, maybe these green sticks of uh, dynamic memory, your RAM. Um, and then, you know, for the experts in the room, you're probably thinking more about uh, the different mediums, allocators, allocation size, access patterns, caches, um, at various levels, these types of things. Uh, but there are many levels of memory here. Now, how many folks have seen this uh, memory hierarchy? I just call it the triangle. Has anybody seen this? Grabbed it from Wikipedia. Um, it's actually an important part of uh, computer architecture when we think about the different mediums we have. And um, basically, at the, at the bottom is your cloud storage, right? It's not to uh, scale here, but this is your cheap memory, which you have a lot of, 
uh, but it tends to be a little bit slower. And at the top here, you have things like the registers. You're really close to the CPU or on the CPU um, that you can access things quickly. Um, and we do like to think about you know, where our actual data is being placed. Um, if you get into gaming, graphics, low latency trading, all these sorts of fields where performance, you know, every nanosecond matters, uh, we have to think about where our actual data is stored, which sort of level here. Uh, but for this talk, we can just think about having access to a bunch of working memory. Um, so it's sort of a, um, you know, I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, but we get this ability to just think of, at least when we're programming, and especially when I started programming, just thinking of, hey, I have a whole bunch of memory. Um, it's just this contiguous chunk, you know, from zero to a million or something. That's how many bytes I have. Um, I don't really have to think about things too much. And there's an important mechanism um, that was developed actually by a physicist here. Um, known as virtual memory, okay? So that's, that's something that we programmers from our programmers' uh, viewpoint are, are thankful for. You know, our operating system takes care of uh, making the memory contiguous for us. All right, so here's our view um, as a programmer for the most part of main memory. At least most of the time when I'm programming and not thinking, uh, you know, about uh, performance or optimizations, this is how I view things. I have one of these uh, sticks of RAM here, my working memory, and it goes from some address uh, up to some other address. And I can store some information in here. And then, of course, when we create a variable uh, that is creating some storage somewhere here in this uh, main memory. So let's go ahead and add a variable here. So I'm allocating uh, int x here for 42. And of course, you know, in C++, we have strong types, so we've specifically said, hey, this is an integer, that's four bytes, typically, uh, to store this value here, 42. So you can see I've stored it in, you know, four of these uh, boxes here. All right, so not too bad here, makes sense. Now, as I'm storing things, um, for, for most of us, if you're working in an environment like, you know, I have my desktop machine here, uh, Windows, Linux, Mac machine, that's a general purpose computing machine. So usually there's lots of processes running. If you're in another environment, you know, if you go to work for PlayStation or uh, Nintendo or these other devices, might have more special purposes. But in general, the operating system's viewpoint um, is that we're allowed to have many processes running. Right, so we have something that looks a little bit like this. So process A takes some amount of uh, bytes that are allocated to it, and process B has some amount of bytes. And you know, as you open up a bunch of Chrome tabs or whatever, you get more of these processes. And soon you have hundreds of them uh, running here. <laughs> but they all have their memory space um, where you can store things, right? like these integers, uh, 42, and so on. Now let's just go ahead and zoom into one process because that's really all that uh, matters for this talk here since we're usually thinking about one program, at least um, or for today we will be. Um, and that's just one process that's running. So again, we have a whole bunch of bytes and we can just sort of think about it uh, in this way. Now this process itself is organized into a few segments of memory. Um, and this is where things start to get a little bit important when we start thinking about pointers. Um, so the idea here is uh, a single process is broken up into different segments. Have folks seen a, a diagram like this at any point? Maybe if you've taken a computer or architecture class or OS class, you, you've seen these types of things. But for those who haven't, um, your program is divided into different segments uh, for where it's gonna store information. And that sort of makes sense. You need some uh, room for the actual code that you've compiled and put somewhere. Uh, some of the data, um, and maybe this is data that you've uh, statically allocated or um, initialized, string literals, these types of things could go in here. And then you have these other things here, the heap and the stack. And that's what's gonna be important for today for understanding our, our discussion on pointers. Um, and if you'd like, you know, this is again a simplified view of uh, program stack. For, so for those who have seen this, or maybe the experts you might dive into and talk about you know, all the debug information and other things uh, that are stored here. Uh, there's some great tools, Tool on Mac and Objdump for Linux, uh, if you want to see these actual uh, segments here. I think, I think it's a great visualization. Uh, but as I mentioned, let's just go ahead and start with the stack memory. And that's our temporary memory uh, where we can store things. So again, simple program like this, int x equals 42, uh, and we have uh, C out here, pronounce some address. What does this look like when it's executing? Well, sort of one line at a time, we've got to allocate some memory for 42. 
So that goes on the stack, our temporary memory. Uh, and, we, and we need to think about why it's temporary or where its lifetime is in a moment. And of course, you know, it's kind of interesting to just see the address. So I'll actually put the address here, uh, you'll see, um, and retrieve it, okay? And again, another interesting thing to do just to understand this is um, when we get into heap memory, if you take the addresses of these, they should be in relatively different uh, spaces here. So you see this one starts with 16, maybe your heap one will start with you know, 70 or some, something else that's further away. Again, to show that these are different segments. All right, so anyways, there's uh, 42 placed on the stack here. Uh, and then you know, let's add a little bit more complexity, so slowly add to this here. Uh, and what happens when you allocate multiple variables? So this time I've got uh, two variables here, 42, that's for this uh, x here. And then y, well that also goes on the stack and it's uh, growing downwards here towards our code. Right? So our process is allocated a fixed amount of space. Okay? Um, and that's, that's gonna be uh, important and there's a reason for that. Uh, so our stack is sort of growing downwards. Right? Let me just replay that in slow motion. So add one variable, add another, and so on and so on. Um, so that's, that's what you'd get here. And again, you can sort of prove it to yourself by just printing off the addresses. So again, you can use some of your C++ tools, right? The ampersand address of operator uh, to actually print out these addresses and see that they're, they're shrinking, they're getting smaller. All right, now when we reach the end of our current scope here with our curly braces, again, C++ being a curly braced uh, language here, uh, this is telling us that we've reached the end of our current scope in which we've allocated these variables here. Okay, now this is something called, when you have a function like this, a stack frame or just a frame uh, for short. And what's gonna happen is, well, as we reach this curly brace here, we're gonna pop off our variables here that were temporarily allocated in our stack uh, in reverse order. And when we say popping, I don't mean like grabbing them and throwing them somewhere. <laughs> what we're really doing is just moving this uh, thing called the stack pointer. Okay, so this is just pointing to an address. Again, this is just some um, mechanism in our actual hardware here. That's basically just to say, yeah, we'll move backwards here. So the next time, you know, we need some space, it'll go here. Now, 42 is probably still here. Maybe it gets cleared. Again, it just uh, depends on your, your operating system or um, how things are working. And again, uh, we pop both those uh, items off. All right, so at this point, hopefully we just understand stack memory. It's automatically managed for us. Memory is placed on a stack in a specific spot in each process that's running. And the memory is getting reclaimed at the end of its block scope. Okay, so pretty simple model, uh, sort of makes sense. Um, and performance-wise, this is uh, great for working me with memory. The stack is very fast. We push stuff on the stack, and then we push it off, and it's in a nice, contiguous uh, block. All right, so uh, my next question, though, and this is to, to quiz if you are paying attention or thinking about lunch, <laughs> is, you know, how much data do you see here? And again, coming from sort of a games background, this is from the Unreal 5 uh, Nanite engine. Um, and just humor me, how many people see a lot of data here? Lots of, you know, objects and polygons and triangles. How many folks see very little? Folks in the back row, okay. <laughs> Most folks, um, and I get to, since the camera can't see the audience, uh, <laughs> you know, humor me here and there's a lot of data. We can maybe argue what a lot means actually, you know, but this is several gigabytes or on that order of data being presented, which I would say is a lot of data, right? It's not just a few bytes, it's gigabytes, something huge here. Okay, so, um, and in this particular case, it's, it's probably an understatement. It's, it's pushing what hardware can do. So I would say it's a lot of data. So then my next question is, if I've got a lot of data here, gigabytes, something huge, uh, can I store all this data on the stack? What do folks think? Yes or no? I see head shakes, no, and verbal, no. Right, yeah, because it's, it's growing down. We've got a fixed amount of space um, for each process. So if we grow the data down, it's gonna crash into our other sections of code effectively, right? Overwriting things. Uh, you know, this causes stack overflow, right? Our favorite website. <laughs> so we have to have some other mechanism here for large allocations uh, at the very least here, right? So if I've got a lot of data, I need to store it somewhere. 
Um, and what we really need here, uh, and I should say when I talk about some of these things, yes, there are ways to resize your stack. And again, if you're in, I've worked in certain environments where there is no real distinguishment here. But in the general case here, we need somewhere else where we can store uh, our information. Uh, and that's the heap, OK? This huge heap where we can store um, large allocations or allocations where we don't know how much memory we're going to actually need at compile time. OK, so heap memory for dynamic memory allocations. So again, heap memory is the memory that we allocate at runtime. And since we're allocating at runtime, there is actually some sort of um, algorithm or data structure behind this. Uh, how many folks in the C++ community have heard or, or maybe worked in environments where you say, oh, I don't like heap allocations. Too slow, too slow. Right? Yeah, so, some folks are raising their hands. And again, the reason for that versus the, the stack, well, you like that. Push on, push on, pop, pop, you know, just very simple operations, right? And your data structures owe one time to do these things. Heap, we've got to find where the storage is, grab it. You've got to talk to your operating system, all these different things. But it's sort of a necessary data structure, right? Because we need to decide, I need a lot of memory. Or, um, you know, at runtime, make a decision about how large you want some actual data structure. All right, so when talking about the heap, though, since I'm asking for memory and need to place it somewhere, well, this is where pointers start to come in. So I promised we get to pointers at some point here. <laughs> um, but the idea is, again, if a pointer is something that holds an address and we're requesting some memory from the heap, uh, then we can kind of keep track of where that came from or where is that memory in this you know, data structure, this heap, or sometimes called the free store. All right, so I'm just going to represent it something like this, right? A large collection of bytes. And again, this data structure might be a list, array of arrays, or you know, um, various uh, tree sort of structures. Um, maybe for folks who've worked on Linux, there's sort of the, a, a buddy system or buddy allocator. Um, all different ways that you can sort of grab some collection of bytes. But for now, let's just look at it as sort of this contiguous byte here, some, some array here, large collection of bytes. So when we want some storage, we have to manually allocate it. So this is pretty much the same example we had before where we were just putting into x42 or whatever. Uh, but this time we're saying, hey, I explicitly want some new memory with the new operator. And this is going to say, hey, grab that. You know, ask the operating system for permission to give me you know, this little chunk of memory here. And uh, when we want to assign it, um, you know, we have to dereference this memory. Uh, sort of follow the address and set a value or place a value in that box. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, now you might have noticed in this visualization, I put a little four in the first box. Uh, does anybody know what that's there for? Size. Size. Yep. Yep. So again, this is some data structure. We have to do some some bookkeeping. Another reason we have to think about how things are working on the heap. Awesome. So there's just a little aside there. All right, so new uh, int, um, we call this new operator or, or function, um, or allocator, I should just say, just return an address to some new memory, right? And it was big enough for the four bytes storage in any header. If you want to just think about it as four bytes, you know, on your part as a programmer, you know, that, that's fine. But know that there's more interesting stuff going on here. Um, but again, we needed a pointer here on the left side to store or know where this actual information was. OK, we have to sort of keep track or be able to, to grab that data. And then the trick here, though, is before our program terminates, we're going to need to delete that memory that we have allocated. Again, we don't have this nice sort of guarantee like we had with the stack that things were just going to push and uh, pop off for us. Right? We're in control. We asked for something, so we also have to give it back. That's the polite thing to do <laughs> for our operating system. And again, this is going to matter more and more depending on your domain. But um, typically, we want to give our memory uh, a back. OK, now, this is where, as a programmer, we have to make some decisions, though. Um, and we have to start thinking <laughs> a little bit here, meaning you know, how long is that memory going to live? Um, is it going to just go out of scope, or do we want it to be long-lived? OK, these sort of uh, heap allocations we have to think about. Is it going to live forever for our entire program? 
Um, so when we make that decision, we can use the delete here to delete our data. And that reclaims the memory or makes it available in our process to be used um, or, or reallocated or, or repurposed in some way. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do the same thing where we'll delete the data. Um, and I'm just going to put question marks here. Again, for, for folks who are maybe advanced, you know, maybe this gets coalesced or combined into other blocks or these types of things. But for now, we just don't know it's here. This, this memory is marked as available to, to put something else in the boxes. Okay, so we've done our job uh, as a programmer at this point. All right, so quick uh, breather and recap here. So we've talked a little bit about the stack and the heap memory. Okay, so if you're comfortable with those things, we're in good um, position here. And the stack and the heap, again, are part of a process which is broken up into different segments uh, for these different types of memory. Okay? And the big distinguishment here is the stack was automatically managed and the heap is something that we have to think about. How long does something uh, actually live? Uh, and we get to decide that with new and delete, explicitly calling these um, operators. And then our pointers, where these are coming into play, is, well, that's our tool that can hold the address to some memory that was given to us. Okay, so we have to keep track of it. All right, so let's take a little bit closer look here, now that we're feeling uh, comfortable, hopefully, on, heap our, on our heap allocations. So again, just taking a look at this from a system's point of view here, uh, let's see what happens again when we heap allocate memory um, with new here. Okay, so again, here's gonna be our heap memory at the bottom. Here's a little sample program here. I've got a main, I call this function run main loop. Again, a little toy example. And I have this while true here, uh, allocate resource, new int. All right, seems reasonable. I don't know, we have a long running program, a game or something. Uh, well, you know, the first time we run this, right, we're gonna allocate uh, on the heap here. Uh, and then we're gonna run through this loop again and allocate again. And again, and again, and again, and again, right? Every time through this loop, we're allocating a new uh, integer. Okay? Has anybody ever written a program like this? <laughs> yeah, intentionally. Most people are saying, no, no. You know, I, I run this example when I talk about memory, and, and I'm usually lucky if I can kill the process before my computer just shuts down. So I'm not going to actually run this one. Because <laughs> so as you can tell, it's taking up a lot of memory, right? Our machines are fast here. <laughs> So the major problem here that we have is we're leaking memory, right? We're, we're just allocating and allocating and allocating. We don't free stuff, okay? Uh, now, if our machine has infinite resources, maybe we're okay. Uh, but again, let's, let's sort of visualize this um, here. And again, I've got my heap memory at the bottom. I've got the same program on the left here. And then our same sort of, you know, stack heap uh, visualization here. But again, the problem here that we have is that every time I run this code, I'm allocating, well, I'm allocating on the stack, actually, this you know, pointer here, allocate resource. Uh, the memory that allocate resource points to is on the heap. Remember, when I'm doing new int, that's saying, hey, give me something in this data structure that's gonna give me you know, enough room for an integer. Uh, but when I exit scope, I'm losing this pointer on my stack that, that points to the heap, okay? That, that was our sort of handle into the actual memory. Okay, so I'll sort of just walk through it again, visualizing what's going on here. All right, so I've just got this thing on the left-hand side. That's, that's stack allocated, right? Give me one pointer, and we put it uh, on the stack here. Okay, so I'll do that again here. There it is, you know, you know maybe it points to something, not yet. And we get a uh, new int. We say, hey, give me some memory operating system. And then it puts something in the heap here. And look, on our stack here, we have the address of that thing that's in our heap. Okay, so we're good to go there. First iteration through, now we can you know, do some interesting work in the rest of our program. Uh, but again, uh-oh, you know, we hit that curly brace here, and uh, our stack allocated stuff, right, the stack pointer moves up, and effectively we've lost you know, what was in our memory here. Okay? But our heap's still here, our trusty heap here, long-lived until we say delete. All right, so we go back and run this again, and well, we get our second you know, allocation here, Something else comes in the stack that points to you know, this block of memory, uh, and we just have this other block here. Right? And, and we could sort of do this forever and forever, but I can only make so many slides. So, <laughs> um, so, so that's, that's the issue, right? We're, we're leaking these memories um, each iteration of a loop. 
our stack's doing okay, but the heap's, the heap's in trouble. We're wasting a lot of resources. Okay? So, you know, we have no pointer now for this first allocation, and this is a resource leak, specifically a memory leak. Okay, so the memory leak fix. Oh, we could do something simple here. We could just, you know, add a delete in our uh, loop here at the end, right within the scope. Uh, that would be one way to fix it. Um, you know, you might question yourself and say, hey, why aren't you just stack allocating in the first place? Uh, but that's what we need to do, right? We need to match this new with a delete somewhere in our, our program. And, and maybe I make that fix though, but again, some programmer comes in here, I'll, I'll blame myself, it was me, you know, you can get blame me <laughs> on your code. Uh, they come in later and they decide, hey, I'm gonna change this code, and you know, you're allocating that integer, but I decided we needed 500, you know, we just need more resources here. So I'm gonna allocate this, uh, but me being a little bit lazy, um, I didn't update this delete here, right? We know we have this delete with the brackets that we also have to match. Um, so that's a little bit of a problem, right? Delete and delete with the brackets, they don't do the same thing. So delete without the brackets, that just deletes the first uh, of those integers and we're still left with 499 of those, right? So another mistake I've made many times. All right, so you know, here's the fix. The code on the right is the correct version. The code on the left is broken, right? We're still getting that uh, resource leak. All right, so my point with that example um, and some of these uh, other examples is it's not always so obvious, too, sometimes where to uh, delete. Again, I'm being a little bit difficult, but realistic. These are real uh, issues I've inserted into code bases and got in trouble with. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm sharing my lessons, right? Learn from me. Um, you know, sometimes it's just not always obvious where to delete something because, okay, we've talked about scope and, you know, maybe where to delete something, but you know, what if I have this data structure, here's a vector, vector of pointers, now that's a little bit dangerous uh, in itself, <laughs> but of these objects here. And then in a different scope, you know, I'm allocating these objects, pushing it back into this structure. Maybe this is happening some other function away here, right? Now am I supposed to delete everything in the vector here? What if these resources get moved somewhere? We're gonna talk about move um, in a little bit here. But the point is that we really have to think about how we're reclaiming our resources when we're just using these pointers, right, and these operations, new, and saying, oh, I gotta match it with a delete or delete bracket, um, and, and you know, what's going on here. So the little reminder here, um, just on object uh, destruction, something that could be handy, is for us to remember uh, RAII, resource acquisition is initialization. Right, so with our heap, uh, I mean, we don't really, I mean, we've got new here when we explicitly call some constructor or grab some memory, and then delete, which hopefully is called, you know, usually in one place in our destructor, right? So we sort of have a matching here. Our stack allocated memory, right, objects are freed and the, uh, the constructor is called at the end of our uh, allocation. All right, so this thing, this destructor here, uh, when that's called, you know, we, we can kind of think about how this might be useful for us so we don't forget to free uh, our resources. All right, so, I mean, at this point, you know, thinking about some of these ideas, and again, maybe you've played around with the raw pointers enough, and you're just like, ah, I've had enough of this, so I want to actually just, you know, build my own class, automate something, make it a little bit easier. So let's just kind of start building a, a smarter pointer, something where we can just wrap our raw pointers and actually make some pro progress with. Okay, maybe we can prevent some of those uh, resource leaks. So, you know, here's sort of the uh, simplest uh, iteration that I can think of here, where we just wanna wrap some raw pointer, uh, where we're allocating some memory on the heap, um, and then just utilize RAII, right? This idea that this destructor will be called. All right, so here's a really simple one here, right? Smart pointer, allocate a new integer, and just delete the data here, right? It's, um, you know, as sim simple as can be. You know, if we're just working with an integer, sure, does this need to be a pointer? No, it could be an int, but uh, we're, we're gonna get into heap stuff here in a second. Uh, but this, this works, no memory leaks here, so this is fine. Um, and, you know, the real uh, powers of this, or some of these things, when we're starting to use RAII, um, 
this convention, or you know, this is arguably, um, I think in Bjorn's uh, words, one of the best features of C++, uh, right? And C++ programmers will learn, or you will learn to embrace this. <laughs> um, but you know, in this example here, I'm doing you know same same code above with the integer here, but uh, you know, every once in a while we start you know throwing exceptions or these sort of weird things. Uh, so if I have a try catch block here. Uh, where I've you know created this smart pointer here, and then I throw some error. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with exceptions, right, that's going to change or transfer your control somewhere else. Uh, it kind of becomes unclear where the scope is uh, going to end here. And if that throws taking it somewhere else, so the program's terminating. Did that resource get freed or not? Um, well, the answer in this case is it will because. Um, when we return from the uh, exception, the stack's going to unwind and we'll eventually um, get that destructor called, right? So you can you can test this out. Now, if I was doing this, say, at line 21 and just, you know, uh, allocated an integer and then maybe at, after line 22 here, tried to call deletes, uh, that resource wouldn't be freed, right? We've, we've thrown, we've gone somewhere else in our execution and we've lost it, all right? So we sort of like this uh, idea. All right, so let's add a little bit more uh, power to our smart pointer. Let's make it templated, because we're kind of tired of working with integers, right? We want to uh, be able to use any resource at this point. Okay, so just one small code change here at line three. Um, I've just made this template, type T, and you'll see everywhere in my code where I had integer, I just made it a, a T here. So any type here. Right, so we have smart pointer with an int here. All right, and again, you know, earlier I made that mistake where I couldn't quite remember if I if it was delete or delete with the brackets or again you might make some code changes elsewhere and forget these types of things. So this is where you can start to handle these conditions in your smart pointer. So here you'll notice I have a uh, smart pointer, two different uh, constructors, uh, sort of the default one and then one that takes a size. So if you want to do that example where you allocate 500 integers, you can just pass that in here. And then maybe you can do something in your destructor like this, where you say, well, OK, if my data is not null, if the size is greater than 1, oh, yeah, i got to remember that rule where I uh, delete with the brackets. OK, otherwise, just delete the data. Uh, and then, of course, you can add, you know, make it null, set the size to 0, you know, whatever other cleanup you want to do here. Um, and there's various ways that you can do this. This is probably the simplest I can think of. You might see others where they, you know, add a different template parameter or some policy, but um, this, this sort of gets the point here that we're going to clean up after ourselves, okay? We're, we're having to worry about less of these uh, edge cases. All right, so that's uh, all fine and well. We've wrapped a pointer, uh, but we can't really do anything with it yet. Uh, so we need to add a little bit more power, right, as we're building up our, our smarter, smarter pointer uh, class here. Uh, it's, still, it's still quite dumb, but it's getting smarter. <laughs> um, and you know, so we are going to want to do things like maybe assign it or dereference it, right? Get that value back. Maybe copy. Ooh, okay. We might want to think about that. <laughs> but let's let's just look at assignment right now. Let's be able to you know assign this pointer to you know some other address, right? So we have operator equal here. Okay, so we have a little bit a uh, little bit of code here, right? Make sure you don't assign yourself to the same thing, otherwise just return. Uh, if you're going to assign to something else. You know, destroy your old memory and then assign the pointy to the, the right hand side. Okay, and we're sort of following what a uh, regular pointer would do, right? Just with an assignment, you point to the other thing. Okay, uh, so that seems seems reasonable. Okay, so now what we have is a smart pointer uh, that can also share data because I can have a bunch of these smart pointers and I can point them to other smart pointers. Right, and again, if you look at my talk or some of the other previous talks on pointers, this is one of the real big powers you have, right? This ability to have uh, a bunch of pointers pointing to the same piece of information. You update one piece of information, all those other uh, pointers that are, you know, this indirection allows you to get that value, right? So that's, that's a great thing. Uh, but I think it's within my uh, abstract, with great power comes great responsibility, okay? So <laughs> let's see if we can see where this is going here. Um, so if I update, you know, my one piece of data here in S2, let's make S2 sort of the important uh, piece of information. 
So S is going to you know, point to S2. S1 is going to point to S2. Everybody's pointing to S2. Okay? So whatever is in there, they've all got sort of a handle or a way to get that uh, value. All right, so here's my uh, heap memory, right? These smart pointers are heap allocating here. So S, and S is data, S1, S2, all right? Now, let's see. Next step here, S equal to S2. Okay, so it's pointing into S2's data. Uh, we're doing sort of the, the proper thing, right? We're destroying uh, whatever was in S here, and now just pointing to S2. Uh, and then we do the, the same thing with uh, S1. Okay? Folks okay with that? Uh, or maybe uh, okay following along, but maybe not okay what's going to happen when I press my uh, right click here. <laughs> so this data uh, moves here. Uh, and then, you know, here's our picture of the, the heat memory. Right? So these data is deleted, this data is deleted. Um, but there is a problem that's coming up here because, again, these smart pointers, right, when we hit this curly brace, well, what's going to happen? Uh-oh. Double free detected here. All right. So let me sort of back up here. And again, remember, S, S1, S2, all of their destructors so are going to be called here at line 54 within the scope they were declared, and the destructors are going to be called. All right, but they all point to S2's data. So they're calling delete on S2, delete on S2, delete on S2. Uh, most operating systems will probably give you this double free detected. Some might not. Some might kind of quit quietly. But you know, if you delete the same memory over and over again, that's probably an indication of a problem. <laughs> probably not your intent to do that. At, at the worst case, you know, it's harmless. Uh, it's redundant work. Um, that's indicating some error. So this is what happened on my Linux machine here. Okay, so not good. Okay. So again, as soon as one of the destructors is called, and each of those smart pointers were pointing to well, S2, or smart pointer 2, uh, we get that memory deleted over and over and over again. All right, so a little bit of a recap, then we'll move into kind of the finale, or two more segments, I guess. Um, you know, we've taken this time to understand heap allocations and trying to avoid memory leaks. And we've been building up this sort of wrapper around just a raw pointer to get uh, something that's a little bit smarter. It'll at least do the right thing, call the right delete, and so on. And we're utilizing RAII to take advantage of that to get the right things to happen at the right time, meaning the destructor to call and delete uh, our memory. Uh, but we're having this problem with, well, when we're sharing pointers, we have to be careful. Okay? So, so now we need to think about, when we think about memory and ownership, who's responsible for that memory? You know, was it S2's job, S1, S? Who, who was it? Who's the boss? All right, so <laughs> we have to think a little bit about here uh, our smart pointers um, and the different design decisions that we have to make. And this is where you can start to get into, you know, modifying this class if you're building it from scratch into um, different types of pointers here. So let's just talk about... Um, Again, this um, you know, understanding our, our problem here and the ownership. Again, the culprit for the double free was multiple things pointing to the same chunk of memory uh, and, and deleting it. But one possible fix might have been to just say, hey, you're not allowed to use the assignment operator um, you know, and reassign things. Um, and that's, that's a valid uh, form of ownership. Um, and, you know, for those of you who have done some smart pointers, uh, you know, this is getting into uniqueness or unique pointer is the actual name uh, in our standard library. So we could actually just disallow sharing. Say, hey, our, our pointers, you know, they don't play nice. They're really just for doing those heap allocations and then, you know, we'll decide when they are uh, deleted later. Um, so disallowing uh, sharing is fine, right? You can just call delete on uh, the... Uh, assignment operator or the copy constructor, or just make these private, right? Those could be your strategies, uh, right? Pre-C++11, you'd make those private. Um, and you'll actually get a compiler error when you try to do any uh, assignment, okay? So I'll say error, use of deleted function, et cetera, and that's fine. And again, that, that's giving you some sort of information about maybe the intent of, well, only one owner of this piece of information. But one thing to keep in mind with these um, unique owners, you 
probably you're still going to have to, or you should, <laughs> as I'm doing here, or showing you, you should allow, you know, um, if you're going to say, hey, there's a unique owner of some piece of memory, you, you can allow a transfer uh, of information. And this is where move semantics um, come into play. How many folks are familiar with move semantics, rule of five, some of these things? Okay, good, good chunk of the audience here, 50% or so. Um, so again, that would that'd be illegal to transfer ownership to one owner and then, you know, with the other pointer, um, set it to null or, or do whatever. Okay, so we could do this. This is legal here in this uh, little snippet here. Where I can set S equal to move and transfer ownership into S, and then I could um, uh, do, do this again here. Okay, that'll prevent the uh, double free here. Or I should actually, yeah, there, one, one little typo here, yeah. <laughs> move S2 on S, and then uh, this should be S here in S1, I guess. All right, but uh, you know, in, in many of our cases though, we don't wanna have just one owner of a piece of memory. We might want a little bit more flexibility here uh, to have multiple pointers, again, point to the same block of memory. Now, to do this though, again, we're gonna need to do a little bit of bookkeeping here. All right, so this was my, my first try as I was sort of drafting and just thinking up some strategy. Um, and again, you know, you could, Imagine maybe how some of the early folks came up with this. Um, I guess this strategy has been around since LISP, but you know, this idea of uh, reference counting. Uh, you can do a little bit of bookkeeping and say, hey, every time I call that uh, you know, operator equal here, the assignment operator, what if I just could do some sort of bookkeeping here? Now this code actually doesn't compile and I've got the only red I've got here that says, you know, this implementation on the right's not correct. Though even for slideware, it's bad, it's got problems. <laughs> so the general idea I want you to take away is just this, these two things here. This idea that maybe we want to be able to do some bookkeeping of, you know, who's sort of pointing to who, uh, or, you know, how many folks are pointing to some other, this chunk of memory. And then the second idea here is, you know, just kind of how are you going to use that information? So, for instance, if you're in the destructor here and your reference count or however many folks or however many pointers are looking at a piece of memory, if that's zero, then it's safe to delete something. Because nobody's sort of in charge of it. Or if it's one, how, however you want to define uh, the semantics here. All right. So, uh, we can design our smart pointers uh, to share in this way, but we're going to need at least another tool here, something to do the bookkeeping, right? Just like our, our heap, right, was doing some sort of bookkeeping of, of sizes of our chunks of memory. Um, our smart pointers are gonna have to do, at least on the first allocation where our smart pointer, um, sort of create this uh, control block is how you um, hear it in the literature um, or if you sort of grep through um, some of the GCC code. Uh, you could just think of it as a shared pointer manager. And it's saying, hey, you've created this uh, smart pointer S here. So just kind of falling from here. And then once you allocate this, it's got to update the reference count somewhere else. Okay, so we sort of know here. Because if we're just managing uh, that reference count in the individual pointers, again, trying to keep them all um, sort of balanced, and especially if we're in a concurrent uh, application, that's, that's difficult. So we have this other atomic counter that will just sort of update every time we you know, point to the same uh, uh, chunk of memory here for our smart pointer, all right? So that, that's the idea here. And eventually, when this reference uh, count gets to zero, then we can uh, delete everything, okay? Uh, so that's the, the general uh, design here. And, uh, well, I have my note here. Uh, it's in light gray saying the atomicity of the reference counting is something I'd like to measure for performance to compare to raw pointers. Current size feature audience insights welcome, so come talk to me about that. I have one reference here. And it's like the uh, organizers of this conference uh, just set this up perfect. <laughs> and the next talk <laughs> is considerations when working with shared pointers. So, um, you know, free advertisement for uh, Dima there. I, I'm going to be there because I want to learn more. <laughs> so if you're enjoying this talk, or if you're not enjoying this talk, go to that one, and, and that one will be great. <laughs> Um, all right, so, you know, using uh, our smart pointers, okay? So maybe we have this ability to uh, share things, you know, and again, we want to start doing useful things, right? Dereferencing, right? The star operator, right? Th this could be simple enough here, right? We just 
uh, operator star, you know, maybe return our data, right? We can have the non-const version. You can start implementing these. And you might also want to, again, depending on if this is a uh, shared pointer or unique, you know, check the reference count or these types of things to see if it's actually available. Again, you're, you're in control of this sort of smart pointer. Okay, uh, but let's see here. Uh, oh, here, here's the actual error handling. Um, so again, you could check if it's null, check if, you know, in that control block the reference count is zero, and again, do some, some blogging or something uh, interesting to handle these conditions. Um, and this is going to actually get me into the uh, next slide or so of what we actually have built into the standard template library. Um, you know, there, there's other types of smart pointers, one specifically called weak pointer, uh, which I'll show in introduction, which does allow you to uh, point into things, but that memory doesn't necessarily have to be uh, alive or valid, okay? It can still um, operate, so it's a little bit less uh, strict, I should say, okay? All right, so let's actually look at the C++11 uh, smart pointers uh, in the memory header. Uh, and again, if you've done some work with uh, smart pointers, you'll basically have noticed that that's what I've been mirroring in this progression of, of building our own. Um, now, it's not uncommon for folks to still build their own. Most of my smart pointer stuff I learned from folks in, in game industry who had built different um, types of smart pointers. Um, so it is important to know the building blocks, and I'll provide some resources. Uh, for that later, but the three that you definitely want to know that are in the standard template library, uh, unique pointer, uh, shared pointer, and weak pointer, as mentioned. And again, they're pretty, they're, uh, what would I say are, are proxies um, in the sense that these are drop-in replacements for raw pointer, okay? Now, you, you do have to do a little bit of thinking as far as, you know, what power you want to give your pointers or what constraints, um, but they're essentially drop-in replacements. Or anywhere you can use a pointer, you can use one of these smart pointers. Okay, so again, the problems that smart pointers solve, again, in several of these issues that we've seen, right? We're not calling delete or delete with the brackets explicitly. Um, we can actually avoid calling new itself. Um, so I'll show an example with make shared for shared pointer and make unique. Uh, these are factories that are going to be a little bit more safer. Uh, they'll handle things like if you try to allocate um, and run out of memory, right to handling an actual exception and making sure that object gets um, you know, destroyed properly. Um, and ultimately, right, just by making this decision of unique, shared, uh, or a weak pointer, you're communicating to you know, your users, your code base, or thinking about how this pointer should be used, rather than just sort of this, hey, I'm pointing it into memory and you know, what happens, happens. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody documents it. Uh, but again, that's, that's why these are really, really valuable, okay? So just a few um, quick examples, or what I would rather you take away from this is, this is how I would sort of play around with the code if you're learning or just getting used to um, some STL smart pointers, right? Write little examples like this, create a little object, Print out a little message that says constructor and then the destructor, destructor, right? So you sort of know about the lifetime uh, when these things are being destroyed. Uh, and then here is the actual usage. So if I'll kind of highlight around line 25 here, where I'm creating a uh, unique pointer here. And this is just a scope pointer. It's going to delete itself within its scope here, right? So you see I put these curly braces here. Um, and the other note of importance here, I commented out because you can't assign this. You can try this, right? They'll have the snippets available, so uncomment this line uh, and try to compile this, and they'll say, no, you can't assign. Uh, this is a unique pointer. It owns some resource. Now, you, you can't uh, do anything with it. You can move it. You, you can transfer ownership again, uh, but only one owner at a time of that memory. And then the better thing to do here at the bottom is to use uh, make unique here. Uh, it's more explicit, um, you know, we avoid the call to new, and it, it can do some error handling. Um, and I'll actually show you the assembly at the end to show you uh, it's about equivalent um, as far as the, the assembly. Um, I think we'll have a moment for that. Uh, so shared pointer, the other type here, again, similar to our examples we've been looking at here. Uh, just to show you the example, line 29 here, I've got a shared pointer, my uh, shared object pointer here. All right, so then I can come in, in the scope, um, make a shared pointer um, for this other uh, object here, and then assign it here. Right, and there, there are different lifetimes. 
So what's interesting about this example, if you look at the order, if you run this, is to see uh, when these uh, shared pointers actually get destroyed in what order, okay? Uh, and see that the, the reference counting is uh, taking place. All right, and then the final example, uh, weak pointer, I've got one other weak pointer example after this. Um, again, weak pointer acts similar to shared pointer in that we're able to, uh, it, it sort of, and it works with uh, shared pointers. They can point into some uh, shared pointer and it's gonna increase the reference count, but not the actual um, shared reference count. It's got its own uh, weak counter uh, that's keeping track of. So in that same control block, it's gonna say, you know, what's sort of the weak count? And you could have a million, you know, weak pointers pointing at a shared pointer, uh, but as soon as that shared pointer count goes to zero, then those uh, you know, weak pointers, they're allowed to point to the control block, but then it's allowed to uh, die, um, so to say, okay? So they're a little bit, um, you know, you're allowed to have this sort of invalid pointer. Um, and I wrote in really tiny text here why you might wanna do that, why you might wanna use weak pointers. Um, at least in games when I've used this, and again, you can argue with me as a game programmer, right? We try to avoid dynamic memory allocation. Uh, but the example would be if you had objects that were, say, you know, being destroyed in the actual world, but you sort of, you know, uh, say I'm a, a game object in the world that's gonna get destroyed, uh, but you could have a bunch of pointers pointing so they know about Mike, right, in the world, and those could be weak pointers, right? And then they could be invalidated when, you know, Mike runs out the exit or whatever, <laughs> right? So that would, that would be the idea, okay? Uh, 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 so so y you'd, you would want to handle that condition or, or still be checking um, for the uh, weak pointer to be null, but it, it's acceptable for it to uh, be pointing to invalid memory. Um, I didn't put um, the CPP reference, but you can actually check on the shared pointer the uh, dot count to see what the, the shared count is or the weak pointer count. So you would, I mean, you would probably handle it, but you're not gonna get in, in trouble uh, as much with these. Uh, meaning the program just crashing. You're allowed to have an invalid uh, pointer. All right, so here's another um, just example with uh, creating a global weak pointer uh, at the top. So this thing um, can point to some other uh, shared pointer uh, in this example. And this is the one from uh, CPP reference if you want to uh, check the link here. So the, again, the weak pointer uh, doesn't own the data, but it can point to data if it exists. All right. All right, and there is one other uh, smart pointer in the Library, it's deprecated, so don't use it. Uh, auto pointer, um, that's it for that one. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say else. <laughs> um, you know, so the conclusion, just kind of wrapping things up here, uh, as we have a few more uh, moments here. You know, and you'll hear this consistently at conferences, right? And I heard it enough that I said, hey, I gotta, you know, learn about these things <laughs> and how to actually use smart pointers. I said, hey, what's wrong with pointers? I like them, they're pretty easy. Um, but the reality is, you know, uh, and I'll kind of start at the bottom here just to motivate that, that as software scales, and you really have to think, even at 10,000 lines of code, uh, if you've worked on, you know, even just a, a hobby project or, or someone else's, even at that scale, when you start working with pointers, it, it, that's about where my mind can't keep track of things. So we need to start taking advantage of good abstractions um, to write safer code and you know, uh, do some actual software engineering and, and start thinking about these things. What is the lifetime of this object? Um, how many, you know, who owns this piece of memory? Okay, um, and that's where you get that almost as built-in documentation by choosing shared pointer, unique pointer, weak pointer, maybe your own type, et cetera. Um, the examples today have also focused on memory safety, but um, we can use smart pointers and these types of ideas as well with other resources like um, you know, opening and closing a file or a socket, uh, right? So you can assign uh, custom deleters or things that happen uh, on a resource. Um, so, so it's not just about uh, memory safety either. Um, and if you're not sure where to start, so sorry I'm going backwards here, but you know, prefer unique pointer to shared pointer. 
Uh, again, if you're not sure. Uh, and that could be one thing that you try to do if you have a, an older code base um, and try to see if where you drop in unique pointer, how often you're able to do that. Oftentimes, it's more of a red flag if you see um, you know, shared pointer being used a lot. Again, you're, you're sharing lots of pieces of information back and forth, so usually that means more things have to go right. Um, so <laughs> you have to kind of kind of think about this. And this, this has gotten me into trouble. Um, and with shared pointer, you could also create a cycle um, as well, which is, you know, um, usually an unfavorable thing in uh, computer science, right? We learn about cycle detection algorithms and these types of things. So, Shared pointer A points to B, and B points to C, and C points to A. Then you've got this, you know, cyclic <laughs> relationship. Okay, and you can read the number one Stack Overflow post about you know using a weak pointer to break the dependency. <laughs> All right, so a couple um, you know resources that I think might be useful, and maybe even encourage you to check out the Boost library because um, I've introduced the three smart pointers. Those are going to be the ones that you see over and over again uh, that are useful, but uh, in Boost, there's other types, and, and you'll be able to see a little bit of the um, history for how you know, the STL sort of got the ones uh, based off of Boost. Okay, and there's like an array-based um, smart pointer, so it's, it's not just these, these three um, as well, and you might build your own that have different requirements. Um, another really great uh, series, Scott Myers. Um, who maybe you've seen as effective uh, C++ books. Uh, he's retired now, I believe. Um, but in 1996, he wrote a few journal articles about building a smart pointer class that starts to take into consideration other things like inheritance and polymorphism and some of these things. So it's a really nice uh, deep dive um, that I read, read to help uh, prepare for this. Uh, I've got a few other smart pointer uh, conference talks. Um, and actually, just looking at the source code, as I mentioned, um, GCC's Usually the one I, I look at, um, you yeah, know, it's just quick to Google. <laughs> um, but uh, that has some good information about seeing the actual implementation. So kind of digging around a little bit in these headers is, is useful. And you'll actually see some interesting things with like the shared pointer um, header and for example, like how do they handle the array-based case versus the, you know, just a, a single object, um, you know, different implementations. Uh, for educators and trainers, uh, you know, the ISO CPP guidelines are always recommended. You know, this is one that I haven't, you know, put in this talk, but sort of cheated and squeezed this in here. You know, just thinking about, uh, you know, should you pass around unique pointers as, you know, that we've learned this tool or shared pointers as arguments. Well, the general rule is, you know, uh, here. So, you know, in general, take the T star or the T uh, ampersand, right, the reference. Uh, argument rather than passing around the smart pointer. Okay, and you can you can read about the reason here. Uh, you know, passing the smart pointer transfers or shares ownership and should not be used when the ownership semantics are intended. Okay, so these are some some other you know the edge cases you'll want to uh, look into after. But this this would be the main one. Uh, bonus if time we've got like two minutes, so I'll spend like ten seconds here just to you know tease something here. Um, again, just on the overhead because these are interesting things and you know. Maybe we'll learn a little bit more uh, later today. Uh, but assembly-wise, you know, three instructions to set up this pointer here uh, and allocate the memory. Three uh, instructions to set up the unique uh, pointer. So, you know, functionally they should be equivalent. Now we've got to take a look at what these calls are doing and you know what additional error handling and, and so on. Um, but you know, performance-wise, could could be you know quite quite reasonable as a drop in replacement i would always argue there's probably something else you could change in your code if if you think this is going to be the overhead again depends on your domain though um, and then the last thing i i promised in the abstract just to talk about this so i have to honor my promise <laughs> but uh, new in c++ 23 are sort of coming you know there's these out pointers and in out pointers um, and, and these are for my understanding, at least, is uh, interrupt with C libraries. Right? So you might ask the question, saying, well, Mike, if we're going to go to uh, smart pointers for everything, what if we need to talk to some C library? Um, so my sort of answer to that is, one, you know, this might be a reason to keep using um, sort of raw pointers in your code, right? If you're you know, interfacing with a C-based um, uh, library or, or sort of building that out. That, that sort of makes sense if you have the compatibility. Uh, but what these tools do, has allow you to sort of release the uh, ownership uh, depending on how you're calling into some function uh, for your actual smart pointer. 
Um, so we can read a little bit about these. I think this is still being worked out. I'm not 100% sure on um, you know, if the, the proposal is in or not. Um, but this is going to be sort of one of the next steps to think about. And again, it's, it's reducing your argument of saying, well, I don't want to use smart pointers because you know, we're going to have more tools encouraging uh, uh, this. All right, so with that said, um, you know, I right reached the end here um, before lunchtime. And uh, thank you again, Core CPP. I'll, I'll stick around. I'll be around here for questions um, at any point.